notes on conservation of energy. Now I know that this says honors. Um, this is an video that is applicable for my CP, my non-honor students, as well as my honors. My CP students though know um, at the end of this video there will be a couple additional slides for my honor students that you do not need to worry about. So I'll make that clear when we get to it. Alright, so first, another law for you to learn. This is the law of conservation of energy. And what it states is that energy is never created or destroyed. It only changes forms. Because of this, it's important to understand all the different forms energy can take before we can start talking about the ways that it can transition from one to another. So we already learned about kinetic energy in concept one, which is energy in motion and potential energy. Um, elastic, which is in springs. Um, gravitational, which is things above the Earth's surface. And then chemical, which is in food. And um, energy sources like gasoline and stuff like that. Um, but we're going to learn some more. So here are some more. Based on these pictures, you may be able to guess. This is radiant energy. Um, you could also say solar energy or light energy. They're all referring to the same thing. But this is just light um, that comes from the sun and light bulbs. Um, the use of radiant energy is to see and also as a power source. Um, again, yes, it can be solar or light. Um, also, things that tend to get off, give off radiant energy also give off thermal energy, um, which is heat that just comes from fire or sun, and we use thermal energy to heat things. All right, another type of energy is electrical. This comes from outlets and power plants, and it's used to power electrical devices. So anything that has a core that plugs into an outlet is using electrical energy. Sound is also a form of energy. It comes in a variety of sources, and we most often use sound just for communication. Nuclear is kind of a fun one, and we're going to spend some time on this in our reactions unit at the end of the year. The nuclear comes from releasing energy from the nucleus, which is the center of an atom. Um, it's used in nuclear power plants and atomic bombs and things like that. So pretty powerful energy source. Now, I think potentially the most interesting form of energy is electromagnetic. So this is a form of energy that is reflected or emitted, so given off, in the form of electrical and magnetic waves that can travel through space. And our next unit is going to be um, about electricity and magnetism, and then the unit after that will be about waves. So it'll make a little bit more sense as we go forward. But this is just kind of a crazy thing. I feel like any time you think of something and you don't understand how it works, energy-wise, it's probably because electromagnetic energy is happening. So how do you send Snapchats? You know, how do you turn on the radio in your car and just get music? You know, how do you get... Some of you have hundreds of channels on your TV. That's all electromagnetic waves send, sending energy um, that are giving you those things, which is pretty cool. And we'll spend some more time on this, don't worry. So a skill that I want y'all to be able to have is to be able to do energy transfers or energy conversions um, in order to show that the law of conservation of energy holds true. So be able to say, okay, what source of energy is in this picture and then what is being made? Or what is that energy, I guess I shouldn't say made, what is that energy being transferred into, what form? So for example, this is a picture of fireworks. Well, how do fireworks work? Well, we have to light them basically on fire. Anytime you light something or burn something, that's chemical. All right, so this source of the energy for fireworks is chemical energy that's being released when you light it on fire. And then what's made? Well, light, sound, and heat are all made at once. So this transfer would be chemical to light slash thermal slash sound. All right, over here, these are solar panels. So where does the energy originally come from? It's coming from the sun, so solar energy. And we're using it to make, to, you know, power things electrically. So this would be solar to electrical energy transfer. A light bulb, you can see the wire, so it's powered by electricity. And what energy does that transfer? Well, it makes light. And you could also say thermal, too, if you wanted, because if you touch a light bulb, it will be hot. All right, what do we got up here? We have the phone. And so when you plug in your phone and you're charging it, that's going to be electrical. And then that charging of your phone is going to allow you to be able to send messages and pictures and all that jazz, which is electromagnetic. Also, you could technically say that that electricity is producing is being transferred into light. 
um, in terms of the visuals that you're seeing, and then also sound when you get that buzz or that ding or whatever it is. Now you may have learned in life science class in middle school about, or in seventh grade potentially, about photosynthesis. And it's a process that plants do where they take in energy from the sun and store it in food. So if you remember that, that would be solar to chemical. So sunlight and then making um, chemical energy. And then down here, this guitar player, he is moving the strings in order to create the music. So it would be a kinetic to sound energy transfer. Now, another energy transfer which is important to understand is that between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. And so to understand that, we need to know about mechanical energy. So this is the total amount of kinetic and potential energy in a system. In a falling object, it starts when it's not moving. Like if you have a, a tennis ball and you're holding it above the ground, it's starting with gr gravitational potential energy. It has that stored energy. But as you drop it, the height of the ball is getting lower. Thus, the GPE is getting lower. But as it falls, it's accelerating, so its velocity is increasing, so its kinetic energy is increasing. So as one goes up, the other goes down. So there's an inverse relationship between GPE and KE. But the total energy that's there, that exists, is constant, and that's your mechanical energy. So in this picture, let's say you have a golf club and you have a golf ball. And right when you first hit that golf ball, it's going to have a lot of force applied to it. So it should have, you know, a high acceleration, so it should have a lot of velocity. So it's going to have a high kinetic energy, which means it would have a lower GPE, which makes sense too because at the beginning the ball is lower, so it doesn't have that height. As it moves through the air, though, its height is increasing, thus its gravitational potential energy is increasing. Also, though, it's going to, be start, it's going to have lower KE because its velocity is going to slow down as it fights air resistance. And that's why you're going to have it at the peak of the ball's height and motion. But then as it starts falling the other way in its path, the GPE will lower as the height gets lower, and the KE will rise again as the, acceleration, as the object accelerates due to the acceleration due to gravity. But again, overall, the mechanical energy is constant, and this is due to the law of conservation of energy. So it's not being lost. It's just changing between gravitation, gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, for, for non-honor students, my CP students, you're done here. We can just practice energy transfers. But for my honor students, we're going to use this concept and apply it to some mathematical situations. This is a challenge, but you can totally do it. So let's do an example. Thomas is playing baseball with Matt. Thomas hits the .14 kilogram baseball, and it moves with a velocity of 50 meters per second. Assuming all energy is conserved, according to the law of conservation of energy, what is the height the ball could reach if it's hit straight upwards? Okay, we're looking for height, but what we've got is mass and velocity. So think to yourself, what can we find with mass and velocity? Hmm, we can find kinetic energy. Remember, Ke is one half uh, equals one half mv squared. So if we have mass and velocity, we can find kinetic energy. Now, how is that helpful? Well, if all energy is conserved, that means no energy gets quote-unquote lost. So all of that kinetic energy that we calculate should eventually equal GPE at the peak of the ball's height. So what does this mean we can do? Well, once we find that kinetic energy, we can substitute it for GPE. So we can use KE and GPE. They can be the same thing. Then with GPE, we have a mass, we have acceleration due to gravity, and we can rearrange to solve for height. So that's what we're going to do now. So, first we're looking for height. We know mass. We know velocity. Again, what can we find with m and v? The only thing we can really find would be momentum, which isn't helpful, and kinetic energy. So we're going to find kinetic energy. So Ke equals 1 half times the mass of 0.14 times the velocity of 50 squared. Half of 0.14 is 0.07, and 50 squared is 2,500. 0.07 times 2,500 is 175 joules. Now remember, the key is that all energy is conserved. So what we're assuming then is that all of this kinetic energy that exists when Thomas immediately uh, or initially hits the baseball would be converted to gravitational potential energy at the ball's peak height. 
So GPE also equals 175 joules at the ball's peak height, when for that middle second it has no KE and it's all GPE. So now let's rearrange this equation. We want height by itself because that's what we're looking for. So we're currently multiplying by acceleration and mass, so we need to divide both sides by acceleration and mass. When I do that, those cancel out. And I'm left with the height equals GPE divided by acceleration times mass. So we're ready to plug in. My GPE is 175. My acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, and then the mass is 0.14. That's 175 over 1.372, and then when you divide, you should get that the ball goes up 127.6 meters, which is kind of insane, so Thomas must be the Hulk in order to hit it that high. Okay, now we are going to practice this, so do not be stressed. We will practice, practice, practice.